We welcome you tonight in the name of Christ. Thankful that we are here together. Welcome those in live stream also. I would like to say that the time has come for militant spiritual warfare. The time has come for naivete and laid back things to cease. You can see that the serpents picked up his battle. We got to pick up ours. Got to pick it up. I'm telling you, we, it's, this is not a time now for fleshly kindness and things like this. This is a time for aggressiveness. Yes. If you don't know much about wrestling against principalities and powers, it's time to learn about it. Amen. We wrestle against principalities and powers. They're more real than these people we've been talking about tonight. Uh -huh. How do you contend with them? That's your business to find that out mm -hmm. yeah. and then to engage in it. This situations like this can be overthrown from earth, mm -hmm. appealing to heaven. Yeah. But the church doesn't know very much about this. And there's not many people talking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time to talk about it and to engage in it, to ask the Lord to teach our hands to fight. Amen. And not to cower in corners. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, you'll see that this blends in with actually is what, what we're talking about tonight. We're continuing the eighth chapter of Amos will be in verses four through six. This is our 45th exposition of this book. Now, when God speaks, you'll see he insists on being heard. <laughs> That's kind of a milestone. When, you, when God speaks, he insists on being heard. So listen to him as he speaks now to Israel. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat? making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. <laughs> the second commandment, as you may recall, was thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Amen. That is, pay attention uh -huh. to what I say. Yeah. Now, much is not made of this these days. In fact, I never have heard anybody make much of this. <laughs> But Israel was not a society mingled with other people. They didn't live like we live, with people next door that aren't Christian, people downtown aren't Christian, people we work with aren't Christian. That's not how they lived. They had their own country. They had their own people. They didn't mix. They didn't mingle except like a business and things like this. They didn't live with the ungodly. They, they didn't. They were isolated on purpose by God. So he said, love thy neighbor. He meant the neighbor Israelite, the Israelite next door. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about, y'all should love the Egyptian. Yeah, I'm upset that I was taught a system of religion that, made, that, let, you, that let these things escape your attention. This upsets me. I don't like it. That love thy neighbor as thyself parallels the love of the brethren. It's the same, yeah, amen. It's the same type situation. Amen. Jesus didn't say, by this shall all men know your my disciples, that you love your neighbor next door. That's not what he said. 
that ye have loved one for another. That's how this was with Israel. Now it says Abiram because these Israelites were ill-treating Israelites. <coughs> the scriptures tell us that we purified our souls in obeying the truth. This is 1 Peter 1.22. Oh, that means if you haven't obeyed the truth, you got a dirty soul. Yeah. Yeah. An impure soul. Uh -huh. yeah. You purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto or in order to, unfeigned or unpretended love of the brethren. That's why you were born again. Yeah. Not the only reason, but a primary reason. Yeah, amen. In view of that, that you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in order to the unfeigned, unbelievable love of the brethren, in view of that, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So if you're going to stand up for somebody, stand up for God's people. Amen. Stop standing up for the world mm -hmm. and for sinners and for the disobedient. God's against them. You don't have any right to be for them. Amen. I know you should pray for them and seek their welfare. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But the love of the brethren, yes. don't let that pass you by. Amen. The Israelites were a chosen people by God. They were related by blood, yeah. from the same, same bloodline, to one another. And at the giving of the law, God said they would be unto him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. <clears throat> In fact, all Israelites were to conduct themselves according to Exodus 22:31 as holy men. <clears throat> From that viewpoint, the very thought of a body of people that are holy allowing for individuals within it that are unholy is an utter absurdity. See, everybody knows that this condition exists. Everyone with any kind, it's just a modicum, just a bare minimum of understanding knows that this thing of unholy people being among holy people is very common. It's not to be common in the church. It's not to exist in the church. Amen. The old leaven's to go out, or it invalidates this table. You don't believe that? You better do a little, little bit of reading. First Corinthians five. That's what, that was one of the major issues. It said you can't observe this feast with unleavened bread. You've got to cast out the old leaven that you may observe the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That's what he said. Yeah. Amen. The point I'm making here is Amos is going to deal with unholy people in the midst of a people that God said were going to be his people, a kingdom of priests yeah. uh -huh. and a holy people. It was an intolerable situation. I will show you now that when one person, one unholy person in a body of holy people makes the whole group unholy. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. It's a little bit hard. I, I'm telling that's a little bit hard. I know. <laughs> I'll swallow it because I'm going to show you it's the truth. Yes, amen. Remember this incident about Achan? Yeah. Let's read about it in Joshua 7. The children of Israel committed a trespass. That's plain enough. Everybody understands that, don't they? The children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, that's one. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, just so we know who we're talking about took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Achan, 
the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Yeah. Amen. Well, I tell you, excuse that childish expression, but that is a sobering text. Is this really the way God is? Well, this is the real God we're reading about here. Certain individuals defiled in the churches of Asia, certain individuals defiled an entire assembly. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Here's Jesus talking to Pergamos. I have a few things against thee. That's a church. Because thou hast there them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. He didn't say, now, I've, I've got something against some of you there. He said, I've got something against this church. Yes. I said, I've got something against this church. There's some people in this church that hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we're talking about the real God, the real Christ here. Yes. Now, if that was really believed, which it isn't, if that was really believed, people would be very cautious about receiving into their number yeah, yeah, people that God doesn't receive. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And then to cook up a doctrine that justified doing it. Yeah. In our text, a little leaven, leaven the whole nation. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, he's been speaking against the leaders of this nation. Mm -hmm. huh? He's been speaking against the priests and the leaders yeah. of this nation. He hasn't been speaking about every individual personality. He's been speaking about those that were better off, that were living in luxury. Mm -hmm. But he, it was against the whole nation yeah. because this was, this was leaven in his people. Amen. Zipped it in his people. Yeah, yes. The same thing is experienced on a personal level. You can say, well, I'm doing pretty good over here, but I just have a problem with this. But that affects the whole person. The whole person, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Amen. This is the way God is. See, when God says he's, the people is a is to be a holy people, that, that's what he means. He didn't mean mostly holy people. Yeah. Or the majority of the people should be holy, which we're no, the American church is nowhere near that even. Mm -hmm. I, if anyone cares to postulate that the majority of the church is holy, they're just, they're either unformed or they're de demented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. But see, what I'm trying, endeavoring mm -hmm. to show is, that God does not receive this. Yeah, amen. We know he didn't because he talked about it in the book of the Revelation. And Jesus personally, up to that point, Paul had given an assessment, Peter had given an assessment, John had given an assessment. But when it comes to the church of Asia, Jesus himself, the glorified Christ, gave an assessment. And he said, this is not acceptable. Yeah, Straighten it out or you won't be my church anymore. So, so when we deal with our text here, God's speaking in character, so to speak. <laughs> but let's get into this. I, I hope that wasn't too, too strong. Well, it's good to have some good, strong stuff yeah. once in a while. You know, sometimes you have to take some good, strong medicine. You can't take a little dab of this and a little dab of that. Sometimes you get in a situation, you have, a, you have to have a strong yeah. dose. That's right. Hear this. <coughs> now the Lord's going to direct Amos to speak to a certain people. He's going to tell who he's, who he's talking to. Everything he says is not general. Like he just doesn't make a general speak specifically. Like Paul when he said, let him that stole steal no more. So he didn't just say, don't anyone in the church steal. That's not what he said. He said, whoever's stealing, stop stealing. See? Yeah. It's, that's, this is how, yeah. how God speaks. He doesn't just speak generally and the people just all sort of, everybody figure it out for yourself. It, that's, <laughs> that's not the way it is. He directs it where he wants. He's already addressed those that were living in luxury and he, he already specified some of those people. Those who offer pretentious music to God, he singled them out. 
Amos 5. Those who are not grieved at the affliction of his people. Sixth chapter, verse 6, single those out. Now he speaks specifically again. Hear this. Hear. Hear this. Some words will say, give ear to this. That is, turn your head and look straight at me, and we'll use listen with both ears. That's a, what type of thing. Listen to this. Listen. Hear indeed. Re really. Hear now this, one version says. Listen to me. English Revised Version says. So, listen. so here in the Scripture, everybody in the room from one standpoint can hear what's going on, but that's not what he's... <laughs> Have they not all heard with the hearing of the ear? The word hearing, the word hear, as used here, means to listen, to obey, to hear with attention or interest, to understand, give heed to, to consent to, to agree with. See, it's a strong word here. Don't let this pass you by. This involves this kind of hearing involves focus. It, it involves attentiveness, determination, understanding, speaking, understanding, agreeing, acting upon. It's a big word. Yeah. Let him that hath ears, let him hear. That's the kind of hearing yeah. he's talking about. Yeah. All those are good. In that changes you? Oh, yeah. It can, it can change you, yeah. yeah. Faith does come by hearing, this kind of hearing. Yeah. Not hearing a sound. Mm -hmm. Hearing a sound, mm -hmm. that doesn't bring faith. Uh -huh. Faith comes on the wings of hearing, yeah. this kind of hearing yeah. right. we're talking about here. Which, as Brother Robert said, precipitates a, a change. All those who fail to take to heart, the heart into consideration. See, this takes the heart into consideration. Yeah. The world doesn't know anything about this. Yeah, that's right. See, worldly understanding, worldly tutelage, worldly learning doesn't take the heart into consideration. But God does, takes the heart. Yeah. Amen. You know, Jesus, Jesus said, let this saying sink down into your ears. You rise and fall and get, let it get from your ear down into your heart where it becomes a part of your thinking process. When you hear with these kind of ears, it, it, it permeates your thinking. You begin to think with this, with this in mind. So when God speaks to his messengers, he does demand that his people pay attention to what he says. I actually think, you know, of course, if any of you that have preached different places have preached to sleeping people. I, I would never let them sleep through my preaching very much. I'd wake them up some way, but there's a bit, everyone has encountered this. If you've ever gone to church, you've encountered the infamous sleepers. But you better not sleep, even if you're tired. That's why we always kind of have a covenant in our family. Give me the old elbow if I fall asleep. It's, Wake me up. Don't let me go to sleep. When God speaks, he demands that people pay attention. Now, in a Western society, this is very difficult to do. Pay attention. Because we are being raised in a culture that's filled with distractions. And distractions, you think about them when you wish you didn't. Sometimes you'll see things and you think about them while we're praying. There, pff, there they are. Yep. You wish they wouldn't there. Yet they get to fight. Yeah. That's that's what distraction does. See, we're living in a society that's got too much time on its hands. Yes. So there's a lot of distractions. That's why you have to work at hearing. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's other things wanting you to hear them too. See, mm -hmm. other things. The fact that the admonition is to hear this, hear this, see, hear this, God said. That means that there were other things calling for the attention of, of the people. They were distracted by other things. False religion distracted them, Amos 3.14. Heartless religion, going, going through the religious exercise without 
having God in it, Amos 5.21, luxury had distracted some of them. Here, O oh, ye, other versions say you. Mm -hmm. Some versions, and I think they're probably right, say you merchants, because the text will indicate that's the kind of people he's talking about. So the Lord directs his attention to a particular group of people within his people. With all the people listening, he singles out, see, <laughs> this would not be kosher in today's society. See, so if you're going to rebuke someone, take them off to the side. Don't do it before everybody else. Jesus would do it before everybody else. He'd, he'd just publicly say, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, serpents, generation of vipers. Who warned you to flee? He said that publicly in the temple. This wasn't off, off to the side. You merchants, he's taking due note of something they're doing and saying. They hadn't thought about this. They hadn't really considered that what they were saying and doing was being noted in heaven. Of course, sin does that to you. Sin does that to you. It hardens you so you don't think about what I'm saying and doing is being monitored in heaven and logged in the books that are going to be opened. There comes a time when sinners can no longer hide among a, among a mass of people. Ananias and Sapphira, see, they were hidden for a while. Yeah, then they, come. they were exposed. Diotrephes, remember John wrote about Diotrephes? He was, he, all of a sudden, he couldn't be hidden anymore. Alexander the coppersmith, he... Couldn't be hidden anymore. They were singled out. See, now this is a, if you're sensitive to God and you live by faith and you, you correct things in your life that should be corrected, and then God won't single you out and make a display of you. Well, some of us are very glad that God didn't do this. We, we had kind of turned our back on some things we knew should go on. But if a person doesn't do this, God will single you out. And your sins will be known beforehand, see? The idea here is that those who could, here's what he said, those that swallow up the needy. That's a strong word, isn't it? Yeah. Swallow up the needy or trample the needy or crush the poor or oppress the poor. The idea is that those who could were eager to devour the poor and take advantage of them, exploit them for their own advantage. What little the poor had, they'd take it from them by unfair taxation or levies or something, they'd take what little they had from them, think nothing of it. But by doing this, they were transgressing the law of God. God had said, when you lend money to the poor, don't charge them interest. That's Exodus 22, 25. If they took a garment from the poor as a pledge, I don't have the money right now, but here's my Here's my garment, hold it. He says, if you do that, then return it by night. Yeah, that's right. So the poor will be, will, will be warm during the night. See? Yeah. You take it, don't take advantage now of the, of the poor. The poor, one reason for the poor, one reason for the leaving of the land idle every seventh year, it was so the poor could eat it, eat of what grew of itself in the land and of the vineyards. Yeah. That's one reason for the sabbatical year. Say, well, it was to rejuvenate the soil. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I know, I know that, that that works on a practical basis, but that isn't really why God did. It didn't mean now the soil that I made needs to be rejuvenated, so let it rest. He tell them why. Yeah. So the poor can go through the field, whatever grows of itself, though. People eat that in the vineyards, too. And when you reap your fields, don't reap the corners. Mm -hmm. yeah. Leave the corners so the poor can come in. I'm showing you, he, 
He told them the law, be mindful of the poor. Don't take advantage of it. They've got life. Life is difficult enough for them. Don't make it more difficult for them. And when they gathered the grapes, he said, don't gather every grape. <laughs> Leave some for the poor. Yeah, boy, this is our God. I, Amen. This is our God. If one of the Israelites became poor and had to sell of his, some of his possessions, the law in Deuteronomy and Leviticus 25, 25, and 26 allowed that one of their relatives could buy it back for them, give it back to them. The, the, the people were to open their hands to the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 11. If a man was poor, others were not to sleep with his pledge, but return it to him. This is all spelled out in the law. So it was, God made it very clear, don't exploit yeah, yeah. the poor and the needy. Don't. I learned this when... Uh, I went overseas in 1980 and 1985 that a famous Christian evangelist went over there before I came. And the elders of this body of people called me before I started the meetings. They called me and said, we want to know if you're going to take collections. I said, take collections? I come to give. I, I brought money, my, my own money. I brought money. Several thousand dollars to give to distribute to your people. They said, "Well, they named the evangelist. He's on TV now. Uh -huh. He was here and he, t he preached to s several hundred thousand people. He took collections every night. Now each each person that attended would have three to five rupees. A rupee takes seven rupees to make a penny. So it was a small denomination of money, but they'd have three to five of these little coins in their position, and after that crusade, none of them had any in their possession. And when you take three or five to five rupees and multiply it by half a million, you come up with a several million dollars. What was that man doing? He was exploiting the poor. That's still practice, incidentally. That sort of thing. You make the poor of the land to fail. Strong word. Other reason says you try to do away with the humble of the land. You try to bring to ruin the poor of the land. You bring the poor of the land to an end. I mean, it could be they died of malnutrition or something. It could be that you're trying to get the poor out of the land. As I say, Germany tried that. In my lifetime, Germany tried that. They tried to get the lame and the sick and the, or exterminate them or ship them out, get, get these people out of the land. God told Israel, don't, don't do this. Don't attempt to do this. Jesus said, you know, the poor you always have with you. But, but why, why is that? Why, why is it that God lets the poor stay? Why, why does he make everybody have enough? Well, there's, a, there's a logic to it. Yeah, yeah. And Paul actually revealed it. Mm -hmm. he, he told us why things are this way. Uh -huh. Some of the poor saints in Jerusalem, they, they didn't have enough. Uh -huh. So the churches, they had too much, or some would say more than enough. Uh -huh. So they sent some of theirs over here to help them. Uh -huh. Now, in explaining that situation, here's what Paul said. He said, by, but by inequality that now at this time your abundance may supply for their want. Mm -hmm. But you, you got it, they don't, you moved it. That their abundance also may supply for your want. So you're not always going to be in this state. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sometimes you're going to be like this yeah. and so they'll take, and they'll reciprocate. Amen. That's why there's poor in the land. Yes. Uh -huh. Everybody gets a dose of how much they need God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Maybe you've been in a situation, yes. in a situation where you just happen to know if God doesn't help us here, we're not going to get out of this yeah. financial situation. Amen. Someone come along and yeah. they helped you. Amen. Now, when 
when you've got more than you really need, one of your brethren over here, they, they got the same thing. You help them, and there's an equality. Amen. We both learned a lot from both of these experiences. See, there's an equality. So there's a reason. Yes. Because you talked about how the Lord was very particular about how the poor are treated. And it came to mind where it said that he he's drawn to a broken and a contrite spirit. And like mm -hmm. it's just a thought, but that seems to be a very common spirit among those who are. Oh, well. yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. It's hard for them to live in pride like mo like some people do. I suppose it's a form of pride they could have too. Yes. I'm remembering the phrase that Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you've done it unto me. Yeah, that's right. So uh -huh. These poor people, they count as the least that's of right. these because they don't have a high position. They don't have mm -hmm. a high standing. Yeah. They're poor. But whatever you do to the least, yeah. you've done it unto me. Yeah, see, that's right. God lets them hear it's a curb on covetousness. Yeah, yeah, that's right. See, uh -huh. it's actually a curb on yeah. covetousness among those that have enough. Now you swallow up the needy. You make cause the poor of the land to fail. Saying. See, so while, while you're doing this, this is, this is what you're saying. When will the new moon be gone? that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. <laughs> See, the Israel imposed obligations from God were worrisome. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's why Malachi 1.13, they, they said about their service to God, Behold, what a weariness it is. <sighs> God will offer another lamb. Yeah. Goodness, we just offered one yesterday. God will offer. God will bring in more of the tithe. God will meet during the feast day. And their religion became burdensome and worrisome to them. When the commandments of the Lord are carried out perfunctorily, that means superficially, yeah. me mechanically, they soon become burdensome. Yeah, amen. If a person just, quote, goes to church to go to church, yeah. pretty soon it gets worrisome. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> when the commandments of God are carried out just on the surface, they pretty soon they're, mm -hmm. they're a heavy load to carry. See, when the heart of the people's not in it and their preparation and participation are minimal, their religion gets burdensome. Now here's what they said. The, whether these words were actually said out loud or not, I don't know, but they, they were, God heard them say this. They probably said them in their heart. See, God heard them. Even in the days of Noah, God took note of the thoughts the thoughts of their hearts, of the imagination of their hearts. He took note of their thoughts. David affirmed the Lord understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. Speaking through Ezekiel, God said, Thus with your mouth ye have boasted against me and have multiplied your words against me. I have heard them. Yeah. Mm. No wonder Jesus said, By your word you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now God tells Israel what they said. When will the new moon be gone? Now the new moon was the beginning of months. It was the first of every month. During the new moon, special numerous sacrifices were offered to God on the first of the month. Trumpets were blown over these special sacrifices. The activities of the new moon were so important they were classed with the Sabbaths. It's, and I give you some texts where they were mentioned together. There were times when you couldn't work. First of every month, you had to ded this dedicated the month yeah. Yeah. to God. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> he offered some sacrifices for sins, more sacrifices. 
blow some trumpets over the sack. It took some time. Yeah. The feast of the new moons. Remember, Paul said, don't let anyone judge you and so forth. So with new moons is one of the yeah. things. Yeah. Now God tells them what they said about it. When, when will the new moon be gone so we can sell corn? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? At least they were honest. <laughs> When is this religion get? When is this day going to get over, so we can get on to selling some of the corn? Yeah. That's what they said. They want to get back to the normal course of life and making money. That's that's. Yeah. We know we're supposed to do this, but when, when's it going to be over? And the Sabbath. What about that? And the Sabbath. When's that going to be over? So that we can set forth of wheat. I mean, we can't work on a Sabbath. It's just one day, but when's it going to be over? You get down to business. What are you going to do when you can sell wheat? Well, we're going to make the ephah small. That is, we're going to tell them it's an eight-ounce cup, but it's only going to have seven ounces in it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> we're going to sell something that's a pound, 16 ounces, but it's really going to be 15 ounces. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. We're going to set, we're going to make the ephah. That's the, oh. that's the, the means of measurement. That's right. yeah. We're going to sell them a bushel, but it really will going to be a seven-eighths of a bushel. We're going to make it small. A gallon... Well, but I'll be 120 ounces, not 128 ounces. Of course, people don't do this today, so it's probably hard to understand that anyone would do this. <laughs> See, when I was growing up, they you had the everyone, every town had a butcher. We didn't have the Walmart and all that. We didn't even have that. So at the butcher, and so there was a famous trick the butchers did. They'd put their thumb on the <coughs> scale. They put their meat up there, and they have their thumb, and it's just a few ounces. It, but it mounted up after a while. So that becomes a saying, keep your thumb off the scale. Yeah. Change the method of measurement. Make the ephah small. Now, spiritually speaking, the same, yeah. <laughs> the same principle is being practiced in Christendom. Mm -hmm. Often what's being offered in the name of the Lord has been watered down. Yeah. It's, 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 not really, right. it's not really the pure thing. Like today, when it comes to the things of God, here's some terms that have become obsolete. Abundance, yeah. much more, mm. filled, increase, increasing. See, that's mm. very rarely used in yeah. Christian circles. Things been dumbed down a little bit. Uh -huh. What's being offered is really meager, yeah. <clears throat> paltry, mm. minuscule, scanty, yeah. spiritually speaking. Mm -hmm. So they make the ephah small, take the how much you get, shrink it down, mm -hmm. and make the shekel great. The shekel is what you bought with. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean the shekel would be worth more. It means it costs, but the thing, I'll give, give you less, but it'll cost more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Jews still practice this, incidentally. <laughs> if you've ever done any Shopping in a strictly Jewish store, I, I used to do in New York, there's never a price on anything. Yeah. Nothing has a price. And they don't sell anything. They sell like diamonds, gold, you know, they all, <laughs> everything expensive. And the, the, if you ask how much is this, they'll say, how much do you want to pay? Yeah. They still do this today. Mm -hmm. And if you know what you're doing, you'll get a deal. Mm -hmm. If you don't... <laughs> They make the shekel great, boosting the price. So you have a smaller amount, greater price. When's the Sabbath going to get over so we can get down to shrinking this sefa down and making the cost more and, and falsifying the balance by deceit? They still use it sometimes. There's a person in farmer's market uses this. And so... It's two balances, yeah. and you have an, in this you put how much, like a, a weight, a five-pound weight put in here, 
then you put whatever you're buying by pound. When it's equal, you got five pounds. There's a little needle that put points there. And he said, you make the balances, you falsify them. You, you rig this balance so it'll balance out when it's really not balanced. You rig the scale so it's 4.5 pounds, it looks like it's, yeah. of course, as I say, no one does that today, So, we, but they, they did do that then. Yeah. Now, if this was true in the business fairs of the Israelites, falsifying the scales, how much more is it true in regard to what's offered in the name of Christ, yeah. which is the pillar and ground of the truth? What if you say, if you, you just do this in your mind, you, you put in this part of the scale, you put a scriptural text that has to do with what the subject's being addressed, and if it doesn't balance out. <laughs> but there's a system of religion that makes it balance out. They're able to manipulate the Word of God so it looks like what they said is what the Word said, but they falsified the balance. Get a picture of God here now. Now keep this in mind. This is what they did. <coughs> you, uh, you were anxious to get through this exercise with the new moon and the Sabbath day so you could get down to yeah. shrinking the ephah and yeah. magnifying the price and yeah. falsifying the balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's still that way. People that object to God insisting on their time, what they want to do instead, I mean, it wouldn't be logged in heaven as a noble yeah. enterprise. Well, they didn't end there. We not only want to shrink the means of measure, magnify the cost, falsify the balance, but we want to buy the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of shoes and sell the refuse of the wheat. We want to do that too. We don't feel like we ought to do that on the new moon. Well, we'd never think of doing that on the Sabbath. Well, now, after the new moon and after the Sabbath, that's another matter. So the Lord continues to itemize what the people are saying. See, this is what that they've been saying in their hearts and with their conduct and maybe even maybe even whisper. See, I come from I come from a generation where whether you got home before the dinner was done in the oven was a big major issue. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I was young, this is the truth. Let's get done, we got a roast in the oven waiting. Oh yeah, I encountered this a lot. A lot. They, they, they said before we started, they said, now remember, everyone's got a crock pot going. <laughs> yeah. One time, you remember uh, Brother David Miller? Yeah. He preached at a little church that should have been closed many years ago, but he preached at this. He was gone, so I, I filled in for him. The entire service started at 10, and the entire service ended at 11. That was Sunday school, Lord's table, and preaching, 10 to 11. So he had me teach his class. There was three boys in it. And they told me, now, we got to be out by 11. That's that kind of a people just get up and start leaving. And one boy said, I don't, I don't know why they want to get out at 11. Pizza Hut doesn't open until 1130. Yeah. That's a going on. That's a contemporary thing. So the Lord continues. You remember when uh, when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, he took over. He found him selling things and buying things on the Sabbath day. Oh boy, he it really upset him. In Nehemiah 13, 17, he said, What evil thing is this ye do and profane the Sabbath day? And he made them shut the gates and told the merchants they had to wait outside till the Sabbath was over. See, they sensed, <laughs> Israel sensed that 
at this time that during the new moons of the Sabbath, this really wasn't an appropriate time. I mean, someone might like fall dead or something. You wouldn't do that, but as soon as it's over, we can get back to buying the poor for silver. Uh, yeah. Uh, didn't, even after Nehemiah shut them out, they were still waiting. And they just came up to the gates like, Oh, yeah. yeah we thought you were joking, but we're still here. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember. They waited it out, didn't yeah. they? <laughs> yeah. They were still waiting, so apparently they didn't get the entire message. Yeah, they were uh, not wise to take yeah. my way out. Buy the poor for silver. Now, this refers actually to the like a marketing where they sold people. Mm -hmm. And some people would sell themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They couldn't pay their debts, so they'd sell their... Well, that's what you do when you're employed. You've yeah. sold your time. That's right, yeah. That's what you've uh -huh. done. You've sold yeah. your time to somebody. In this case, they give their life to somebody. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we pick up this free labor, so it's labor, and really get some, a little bit of silver. You get... You get Get it pretty cheap. The poor you can buy a little cheaper. If you got a craftsman or something like that, you have to pay a little more. But the the poor you can get a good deal with that. A bond servant in scripture is someone who was purchased. That's the difference between a servant and a bond servant. A bond servant was someone who was purchased and an agreement was made for a, a duration of duration of time. Now, the law forbade using such an occasion to oppress the poor. Here's the law, Leviticus 25, 39, and 40. If thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as an hired servant. You're going you're to pay him wages. And as a sojourner, temporary, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee under the year of Jubilee, then you got to let them go. Amen. So the Israelites were not allowed to purchase one of their kinsmen and make him work for nothing. Yeah. Now you have to pay him. You remember in James, the way Christians working with Christians, their wages weren't fair. And they were like we might see starvation wages, and they, the people that were paid wrongly cried out to God, yeah. and their cry went up into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Yeah. 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 And James addressed that matter. Mm -hmm. Pay a fair wage. Yes. To your brethren, we're talking about to the brethren. Now, traditionally, the lowest paying jobs are Christian jobs. Yeah. 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 This is what I was thinking of when Sister June was talking. See, the, the Lord, uh, uh, that, that's the read that was impressed upon me to pray that it would be personal with the Lord. That's right. Because when they're doing, that's no right. matter who they're oppressing, they're oppressing God. That's right. That's a serious thing. Very serious. God, God said how well, he feels yes. about this. Huh? And treat him like a temporary, like a sojourner. <laughs> Don't treat him like he's gonna like you purchase him for life. Yeah. He's a sojourner. So instead of doing this, they had a practice of purchasing the poor cheaply, just a little silver. In fact, with a needy, you could buy with a pair of shoes. Yeah. Remember he uh, or a pair of sandals. Remember in the second chapter, he upbraided them for selling the poor for a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Here he upbraids them for buying the poor. Yeah. For a pair of shoes, a pair of sandals, that'd be the about as little, about as little as you could offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A pair of slippers, so to speak. And we sell the refuse of the wheat. Remember why? When is the new moon going to end? When is the Sabbath going to end? So we can get down to this. And one of the things to do is sell the refuse of the wheat. Refuse of the wheat, the bad wheat, or the sweepings of the wheat that were on the floor. Waste parts of the grain, the husks. Selling the garbage as grain. Some of the verses, very first. What they meant was, they had this bag of husks and dust off the floor. and We take a handful of grain and we put it in the bag and it 
it's over to the to the nothing bag and yeah. put a handful in there. Uh -huh. Of course, <laughs> thank the Lord they don't do things like that anymore. Yeah, or maybe you've opened half empty, half full cereal boxes. Yeah. So you know, uh -huh. maybe you've anyway. Mm -hmm. Sell the refuse of the wheat. Actually, the refuse, it means the, the, the word means fall through. What it is is there was a sieve, and they put all the stuff off the floor in there, and only the, only the grain mm -hmm. dropped through. Mm -hmm. Whether what they did, what was left in there, they put, they saved that too. What was left in the sieve. So they objected. <laughs> As if that wasn't enough that they did this. They objected to the new moons and Sabbath taking so much time so they couldn't get this more of this done yeah. mm -hmm. during that time. Hmm. Now, what about in uh, uh, spiritual matters? Hmm. Is that kind of thing ever practiced, you think, about mixing junk hmm. with, the, with the truth? Yeah. Is that acceptable? Jesus talked about some, some refuse. He called it traditions of men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's what, and they would have made, but no, they'd mix their traditions with the Word of God. They had a special, their own kind of Bible. Mm -hmm. The Torah, that's what we call it. Uh -huh. Is it the Torah? What is that they call it where the traditions are in there? There's the Mishnah, which is a commentary on the law. There's the Talmud. Talmud. Two yeah. different kinds of commentary. Yeah, the Talmud. It has more than just the scripture in it. When men, they attempt to mingle the wisdom of the world with the wisdom of God, they've thrown refuse into the sack of thought. And here's what Jesus said about it. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. When they, men take tradition, man's tradition, and they merge it with God's word, mm -hmm. the commandment of God is powerless. Yeah, right. yeah. mm -hmm. it, loses, it loses its power. Yeah, right. Here's something else he said. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So you take a little bit of our church tradition, uh -huh and you mix it with the Word of God, and the Word of God has no, has no effect. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do what Scripture says the Word of God does. Now, brother, we've become accustomed to living with this kind of situation. Uh -huh. yeah. Christians are generally not noted for having any kind of power. Uh -huh. yeah. They've got to go to some kind of outside help to overcome even a bad habit, as they call it. Mm -hmm. why, why is it that the, uh, they lack power? Mm -hmm. Because they've got a mixture. They've got a, what we call an ad mixture. Yeah. Traditions of men, uh -huh. Word of God, they don't mix. Mm -hmm. When they're presented together, the Word of God is not effective mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anymore. Right. Yes? talking about there is actually more insidious than what you were just illustrating. They, what they were doing is, is they had come up with a tradition that allowed them a loophole oh, yeah. to intentionally ignore the scriptures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not, not only were they watering it down, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, they, I'm sure they did that as well, but yeah. the, the tradition was put in place. Jesus gave an example. He said, if you, if you have older parents to take care of, yeah. Instead of doing that, you can set aside money, call it Corban, or dedicate it to God, and then not support your elderly parents, mm -hmm. oh, yes. claiming that, oh, this money's been given to God. Yeah. Yeah. But see, they didn't they did eliminate the reading of the Scripture. That still went on. It, but it, what happened in this tradition superseded yeah. the Word of God. So they went, they, yeah, they... They didn't have enough nerve to eliminate the reading. Even James said every Sabbath the scriptures are read. But that wasn't all <laughs> that was read or taught. Yeah. Their commentary on the scriptures got to be so so big yeah. that they, they really 
they started pushing the commentaries. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. that's what they really focused on. That what they're. Mm-hmm. Well, that was it. That was it. That, this is what brother, what, this is what brother Jason was saying mm-hmm. is that the people gave deference yeah. because of the way it was presented. The people yeah. gave deference to the tradition uh-huh. to explain their conduct that was otherwise condemned by the uh-huh. by the scripture. Say it's a gift. We can't give this to our parents. This is a gift to the temple. Well, yeah. Yeah, put so another gold, put another gold knob up there at the top. So that 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 provided a loophole for them to do what That's they really right. wanted That's exactly to do, right. which mm-hmm. was keep their money for themselves. That's right. Uh-huh. That's right. <laughs> it's a gift. Corban. Yeah, that'd be a good uh, for some uh, people that plead for money. That'd be a good title for their ministry. Corban. Now, the, uh, Paul warned the Colossians about a, an updated version of tradition. He said that he would fear lest they, lest they be spoiled by tradition. Mm-hmm. Philippians 2.8, Colossians 2.8, be spoiled by tradition. Now here, spoiled doesn't mean like spoiled fruit or rotten. Spoiled fruit means captured. Spoiling principles and powers, captured them. So what, what it means here is that you've been carried away as booty. You've been captured and enslaved by this philosophy. You've been snatched from following Jesus. Uh-huh. This is what happened in Galatia. Yes. They had teachers come in and they actually moved them away from him that called them into the grace of Christ mm-hmm. by another gospel to another gospel. Yeah. They became they became victims. Mm-hmm. When re- the true true religion, pure religion, mm-hmm. frees the soul. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this kind captures the soul and enslaves it. So there are many people that the teaching to which they've been subjected has enslaved them. Whereas the truth, if they know it, could make them free. The church has a dispenser of the truth, pillar and ground of the truth, can't mix. It can't mix the wisdom of the world which God has pronounced foolishness. It can't mix that. Yeah. So that, so much so that when you hear a scripture, you think of some tradition rather than what has been declared by the scripture. So, so people will hear a scripture and they'll say, "Well, that doesn't mean." See, yeah. if you ever, maybe you've been subjected to this kind of reach, or they'll say, "Now you're not saying that." What is that? When they heard the scripture, their minds went to their tradition, and it butted heads with their tradition. So they want to know, you're not, you're not saying you don't have to be baptized, are you? See, that, that's what tradition does. It demands precedence. So there you have it. Uh, <laughs> things that would be overlooked by a lot of people. Say, well, that's just, you know, that's business practices, and that's another facet of life, and no. Particularly because they were do, you were doing this to your own brethren. Yes, amen. So always, if you're going to minister to God's people, let minister what, really minister what you say you are ministering. Yes, amen. <laughs> Give the real thing. Yeah. Let it be pure. Don't falsify the balance, and don't over-exaggerate the value of what you say. If it's not, if it's a little bitty thing, just call it a little bitty thing. Uh-huh. If it's great, big, exceeding, then call it great, big, and exceeding. Yes. Let it be what you say it is. Any of you have a word you'd like to say before we close, Brother Jason? Yeah, this uh, this lesson remind me, it reminded me of a principle that we also find in the uh, New Covenant scriptures as well. All of you have probably heard the the word orthodoxy. Orthodox, yeah. It means it basically means right belief, something like that. Yeah. 
There's a there's also such a thing as orthopraxy, which means right practice. Now, the people of Israel they they weren't they weren't practicing their religion. That's right. They mm -hmm. that's right. They were actually denying God mm -hmm. in the things that they were doing. Now there's an there's actually an example of this in the new in the New Testament right. when Paul confronted Peter. Remember that time? Yeah. The Gentiles came, and Peter wouldn't eat with them because he he knew he he'd get it from the from the Jews if he ate with these uncircumcised men. And yeah. He withdrew, and Paul said to Peter in uh, in Galatians, he said, uh, "When I saw." Actually, this isn't what he said to Peter. He says, when I saw that their conduct yeah. was not in step yeah. with the truth yeah. of the gospel, then he, then he confronted Peter. So you can, you can behave in such a way that it contradicts everything you believe. That's right. You can talk and act and treat other people mm -hmm. and, and do things that, that deny the gospel. That's right. That fly right in the face of the nature of the gospel, That's like right. like Peter not eating with these brethren. Here are these brethren coming, mm -hmm. and Peter won't fellowship with them. Well, yes. that's a now Peter wouldn't have said, "I don't believe the gospel," mm -hmm. but that act was in violation of the gospel. That's right, and so that's something we got to think about. Well, hey amen. That's something mm -hmm. Paul said to Titus in work. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Being reprobated, abominable to every good work. So there's the same thing. Yeah. yeah okay. But you will you will find that a uh, a version of, for want of a better term, Christianity, mm -hmm. is now extant in the land. That doesn't it doesn't make this very point yeah. that your conduct has to match your profession. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know the the Lord was very gracious that he gave them these new moons and these feast yeah. days and these Sabbaths to prepare them yeah. to live their life unto him. That's right. And yet they couldn't wait to get done with them so they could live for themselves. That's right. But that, that's the whole reason he gave us that we, so that we could, like the, 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 we have an assembly here. We come together to be edified, built up to where when we go out, we'll be able to live unto the Lord. That's right. Yeah. Amen. It's what the new birth is about. Yes. It coordinates conduct and yes, profession. amen. Yes, it's about. I was considering these meager amounts and your point on making the ephah small. Um, I I can see the intention of an enemy here. Whenever you have a salvation that's abundant, mm -hmm. that he tries to convince people that their portions have to be meager. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's all that's right. available. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so after a while, that's all that they desire. Mm -hmm. That's mm. all that they demand or ask yeah. for. And so then it works full circle again. Yeah. That's all uh -huh. that's given. Amen. So you have this vicious circle of these. The downward spiral. Yes, is. amen. This generation gets less. The next generation gets less and less. Uh-huh. Yeah. Pretty soon you've got falling away. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, we Aaron. I don't think these words up the Lord uses to the people. I don't think he's repeating what they said. I think he's defining what they're doing. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. In other words, the people didn't use these words. Mm -hmm. the, these are the Lord's words that he's He's using to convict the, the people of their condition. So, And that's the nature of sin, is that they they they, they didn't realize, or they, they were themselves deceived about their about their own condition. They weren't. They wouldn't have confessed to to everyone that they that they sell the poor. Some of them may, may have may yeah. have known for sure, but mm -hmm. but the that that's the danger of of being enslaved to sin is that people don't know their own condition. Mm -hmm. It's like in Laodicea, they thought they were rich, but they were actually poor. Mm -hmm. And like the people that Malachi prophesied to, it says God said. You robbed me. And they said, how have we robbed you? Yeah. But that's that's the nature of, of conviction. Amen. Is being confronted with the with the reality of your condition. Yeah. And and coming to confess it. Yeah, I wouldn't mm -hmm. I wouldn't doubt that they did say when will it end? Mm -hmm. But then but then God told them 
this is this was how they reasoned about it they, in their heart. They they would have pioneered cutting down the time. They would have pioneered that if they could have. But then he told them why, yeah. so that you might. Yeah. Kind of opens up quite an area of thought about how the Lord views how we think about Amen. what He has required of us. Yeah. Isn't it a sad state of affairs when you have a religion that gets in the way of what you really want to do? It sure is. I mean, what a what a bondage. I mean, we've all been around people like this. Yes. We've all I've been in churches and around Christian people that that. that the, the practice of their faith was a burden to them. It, yeah. They couldn't wait to get it over with yeah. so that they could go do what they really wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, It is a weariness. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, it is a weariness. Now, what, what, what problem could be with the people? It could be that the people aren't born again. The other problem is they might need a new religion. They're just, they're just some forms of... That's right. <laughs> That's right. Some things that people do that it, it inhibits them more than it helps them to That's worship right. the Lord. And they're yeah. just you got to break out of that old tradition and Amen. get some new wine skins or something. Amen. Yeah, new wine skins. <laughs> It'll break the old, and then you lose both the wine skin and the wine. Lose them both. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the candor of your revelation through Amos. We give take time to thank you for him. It was a it was a ministry that ordinary people would not covet. But he was a faithful, faithful prophet, and we thank you for him, Father, for Amos. And he has uh, taught us a lot of things you have, about your own nature. And so we pray, Lord, that when you behold us, you, you will commend us and not reprove us. In Jesus' name.